Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Buck Stops here. I'm Catherine Murray. Well, there is a lot to discuss today, and I'm very excited to bring our guests on for a very in-depth, interesting conversation, crypto and energy and Elon Musk. Uh, Harris Fricker is joining us. He is the president of Stiefel Canada. Harris, great to be with you today. Um, and, and also, as you said, you're the internet OG, the original. You're back in Silicon Valley as well as Bay Street, Wall Street for so many years. So thanks uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to be here. Thanks. You know, I want to first start out, and I'm asking a lot of friends these days, do you know much about FTX, the collapse, $32 billion that went down to zero, Sam Bankman Free, the founder of it? And, and some people kind of maybe hear it, but it's almost co complex, but it's not really. I, I want to talk about this and understand what actually happened, because billions of dollars have been wiped away, and these were institutional, sophisticated investors, let alone retail investors as well. So what, what's your take here? Well, my take is that it's both fairly complex, and with most things that are fairly complex, as you drill into them, they're actually fairly simple. And it, this was originally a failure in financial engineering, which shouldn't be surprising because in crypto, math and code replace the intermediary. And obviously, if that's the case, then the code in the form of a smart contract or an algorithm has to fully contemplate cause and effect. And we've got legions of examples in financial markets history where we thought algorithms contemplated cause and effect. Uh, I think back to long-term credit in 98. And, you know, an algo or, or a smart contract is good till it isn't. And really what happened was on the stablecoin front, we had an algorithmic stable coin in Terra USD fail. Uh, it had an interesting arrangement with the sister coin Luna, where it was basically maintaining a peg to the USD via either buying or selling its sister coin Luna. And ultimately, traders lost confidence in that trade in April, and we saw $40 billion of market cap wiped out as Terra and Luna decoupled. Um, and went to zero. So really that's about financial engineering and you simply have to accept that that's part of distributed ledger technology and it will evolve over time. The algorithms will get better as AI and richer data come to the fore. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is when Terra and Luna collapsed, as most people in finance would understand, that went to collateral. And as we all came to realize, there were an enormous amount of loans and cross-party transactions that were underpinned by tokens, the value of which was very lofty. Um, and when Luna came off and Terra, you had a lot of people holding those tokens as collateral and the collateral collapsed. So you had hmm. the old thing called margin calls. And the original margin call to in the FTX world was to Alameda Research, which FTX owns about 90% of, which is a, a prop trading house. And Alameda, when Terra and Luna collapsed, Al Alameda had a massive margin call. We tracked it on blockchain and saw the transfer of about $10 billion from FTX to Alameda. Subsequently, mm. it's been as it's been you know stated that four billion of that. 10 billion was customer funds that were commingled. So, you know, we'll see whether that is in fact true. But but that was the genesis was a collateral breakdown. And then there was a little company in Singapore called Three Arrows that had invested very heavily in the ecosystem, including Luna. Three Arrows had large loans from lots of the major players in the space. And yeah. Three Arrows experienced a massive margin call, which it couldn't meet when it fell. Then we saw the dominoes uh, fall. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where we got to FTX coming in as kind of the Fed and backing some of the entities that were offside. And that was through the summer of 22, where, you know, and in many instances, Sam Bankman Fried was being likened to uh, JP Morgan back at the, you know, collapse of the markets in the, in, in the early 19 or early century. You know, so, yeah. But, you know, Harris, he obviously wanted to. He wanted to to be that person to come in and save the day, which he did. And we are all kind of taking a breather, you know, when there's a lot of volatility in the in the cryptocurrencies. And he came in, he caused some stabilization. 
Um, but, you know, did the ego get ahead of what they were actually capable of because they didn't seem to have the money to be able to do this? And to your point, they commingled. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Harris, I want to pick it up um, in, in terms of it, it's interesting that you when I asked you, what do you think of FTX, that you went back to the collapse of those stable coins. We almost have forgotten it because there's so, you know, so much news surrounding FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. Um, but it's, it's interesting. What does it tell you about the entire ecosystem if, as you say, the algorithms um, maybe caused the stable coins to collapse or maybe it was how they were built because somebody has to build the algorithms. I always want to point out that there's a person at the beginning of these things, I think at least still. Um, so it, it, what does it tell you though about the entire system if that can happen? Well, the entire system is built on math and code and that system will evolve with time and become better and better. And there are things that blockchain and crypto will be good at where it has high utility. And just as importantly, there will be things that it's not really good at, that it will have low utility and it, it won't be a factor. But when you look at FTX, you know, they came in kind of as the Fed over the summer to the sector, uh, made a bunch of loans to entities that were, you know, imperiled by the margin calls. And then of course, part two, Catherine, of the story, which is going to make a hell of a good movie someday, um, yes. was you had the Coindesk article on November 2, which was, you know, the second stage of the collapse where they questioned Alameda's balance sheet, which had about 5 billion of FTT, which is FTX's native token. Um, when Binance saw that, uh, ZZ immediately announced that they would be selling their FTT. FTT, there was a run, uh, as you would understand, these things are all about confidence. Once there was a run, FTT came off 75% in 24 hours. So then you had margin collapse all across the ecosystem again, and you had Alameda massively offside. There was a failed rescue by Binance. And then, um, as we all know, um, the stuff hit the fan pretty hard. But mm -hmm. Then we get into a discussion. So we've done the algorithmic source and then it's collateral, which we're all pretty used to. And then you get into, okay, you know, what was FTX? Well, FTX was an exchange that also owned a prop trading house. Typically that would be viewed as a conflict. FTX was providing custody to its customers, which meant even after doing trades, they were leaving funds on the platform, which meant if there was commingling and the company went bankrupt, your funds would be locked into the bankruptcy process, which we've seen mm. um, happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we know that commingling appears to have occurred. And then there's just a, a breakdown in good old fashioned credit, collateral, concentration, correlation, things that, you know, folks that have been in the space for quite some time are pretty respectful of. And just from the commentary, there appears to be, I don't know, some sort of lack of understanding of how the various pieces fit together. Um, and that's obviously, I mean, we saw this, you know, Madoff in 07, Enron. A lot of times you see a derivative start lead to fraud. And how many times have we heard about someone whose intellectual capacity exceeds that of the market? And as soon as I hear that, I'm like, this is not this is not a good scenario. <laughs> you, you mean where they're apparently just so smart, the smartest person in the room and smarter than everybody else? Red flag? Yeah, I mean, you. I, I recall, uh, you know, long-term credit, which was a bunch of Nobel laureates who apparently understood non-standard currencies better than anyone else, and they made money hand over fist until their algorithm broke and the yeah. correlation on the currencies broke and they went to zero. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've heard this yeah. story time and again. <laughs> I think that the big key will be, how does this impact blockchain going forward? Um, right, and what do you think? Key. 
What do you think? Well, I think this is this is going to be a broad scale disruptor of confidence, especially institutional confidence in the space. So adoption will slow. We'll we'll also get you know this was an exchange. You've already seen the SEC commenting on potential additional regulation. Clearly, we're going to have to figure out something different on the token front because we've got a proliferation of tokens, many of which are are worthless. So right. we'll see that uh, shake out. But you're definitely going to see more regulation. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, crypto's at an end or blockchain's at an end. I certainly don't hold that view. OK, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. We have a lot more to discuss, but I just want to kind of wrap it up with respect to the FTX, because I think this is really important as well. I mean, Sam Bankman-Fried has told the Wall Street Journal or in interviews that he doesn't know what happened to the money. You know, billions of dollars are lost. There's so many people that have been affected. And, and again, I go back to the huge institutions that, that um, you know, bought into this. So can we just describe once again, so we're all kind of really clear, because you said you, you track this on blockchain, which is very interesting that he did move money from FTX to Alameda, his prop trading firm, which you're not supposed to do. Well, again, we don't know what was customer funds, what was FTX funds. I mean, who knows? That'll all come out in the wash, obviously. But yeah, yeah, one of our PhDs tracked the transaction on blockchain. You know, Catherine, the interesting thing here is most of what happened at FTX was in on blockchain. It was an Excel it wasn't spreadsheet. On no, really? No, it was not. Absolutely. If you you read some of the commentary coming out of the gentleman who's controlling the company now, um, there are no records. It's Excel shed spreadsheets. Uh, no real understanding of assets or liability mix. Now, now out of that, we're going to get a couple things, right? We're going to get a big focus on proof of reserves or asset liability match cryptographically. That's that's going to become very important, that proof of reserves. We've seen originally, I thought, we originally had custody where it was cold wallet, hot wallet. And, you know, that's pretty inconvenient. So we had third party custodial. Well, we just ha saw what happened when you mix custody and then other business. So we're either going to get third party custody as standalone business like it is in, in, in finance currently. Traditional markets, or people yeah. are going to go mm -hmm. back to People are going to go back to self-custody because they're going to be too nervous to leave their stuff on, on exchanges. And then on tokens, we've, we're going to see a move away from memes to real utility tokens. So tokens linked mm -hmm. to assets on chain that have discernible value versus, you know, memes like the Board Ape Yacht Club, which are kind of standard for nascent uh, markets. But we'll see that move. Mm -hmm. As I said at the sort of at the outset, blockchain is not a panacea. We we saw this with Internet 1.0, which was transmission of info. This is about transmission of value. There are things that blockchain will be exceptionally good at if it can get safety, security, and speed down. We'll see. Um, yeah. we're, we're definitely seeing distributed ledger technology really impact the supply chain, especially with ESG, where provenance and immutability are important. And we're going to see utility tokens. I'm doing a lot of work in the carbon offset space. And it's literally okay. a case study for blockchain and tokenization. Again, utility tokens, not memes. So we'll march forward from how, this. We'll learn yeah. from this. Yeah. And how are you investing in it, Harris? Like, where, What's the area? I mean, you kind of said that you're spending a lot of time on the carbon offset side. How, mm. how do you invest in this or where? I've... So I've been investing in blockchain since about 2015, starting with BTC, which I still think is an exceptional, um, you know, protest currency. Uh, when you think back to it, it was 2008, right after the, we were during the global financial crisis. And I do find it quite interesting how our world is so quick to dismiss the $2.3 trillion of value that's been lost in crypto and the mm -hmm. gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands. Meanwhile, uh, look at the macro outlook. We've had in the developed world a COVID spending that's been unmatched by anything since World War II, where really Canada spent the equivalent of 
you know, what we spent on World War II. Without the Marshall Plan and the infrastructure benefit, it was mainly income replacement. So we've seen Canada's debt go from 885 billion USD to 1.2 trillion. Um, and then everybody's sitting around going, I wonder where inflation came from. Um, right. It's pretty obvious yeah. where inflation came from. The G7 just embarked on a spending program, as I said, that we haven't seen since World War II with no collateral infrastructural benefit. It's been mainly income replacement. So mm -hmm. we've unleashed, you know, once again, the U.S. printing press. And if you think back, that's what crypto was originally uh, created in protest to is central banks' inability to govern themselves in terms of money supply. Absolutely. And that's, that's kind of the base case for, for BTC, Bitcoin. Yep. And it will have its day. And, you know, again, the, this will come down to utility. Where there's high utility, it will be impactful. And where there's not, it will coexist with the existing system, like we've seen mm -hmm. 20 times before in other financial services revolutions. Okay. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Harris, uh, I want to get your take as well on the energy sector. I've personally been long energy since 2018. And with the great run-up we've had, I, I continue to wonder whether or not I should stay within the energy sector, um, just given the different policies around the globe surrounding energy. What, what's your take here? Well, energy has been a source of much consternation uh, to me. We own First Energy in Calgary, so I think we have a pretty good window on that market and sentiment in that region and province. And, you know, you just pull back the first principles, Catherine. Um, we're a small population distributed over the second largest land mass on the planet. Um, and for the last couple hundred years, whether it's Canada or its predecessor, um, we've been made wealthy by resources. And there seems mm. to be some angst in this country about admitting that. And really the head trade that has to happen is number one, resources are a source of wealth. And you have to accept that extraction can occur along with environmental and social stewardship. Um, that's a fundamental premise, which we don't seem to be willing to accept anymore, which to me really makes me nervous about the future sources of, of wealth in this country. Because like any other country, wealth is not our birthright in Canada. So right. it, it really goes to energy as a strategic asset. Remember that energy is our major export. It's about 120 billion USD. The other four make up about roughly equal. And two of those four are wood and precious metals. So mm. in energy, our products it's already meet reaching the market. It's just not reaching yeah. it very efficiently and not via Canadian infrastructure, which means our energy is hitting the market and we're a price taker because our pipeline infrastructure runs south to our largest competitor, in the, namely the United States. And you don't have to be Adam Smith to understand how that works out in terms of pricing dynamics. So mm -hmm. we have a crisis in this country of a fundamental inability to build infrastructure um, probably the, the best example is our failure on LNG. For the better part of two decades, we've been talking about LNG, and we still don't have a single export facility functioning in this country. I've only got about a minute and a half left, and I, I want to get your take as well. Elon Musk, you've known Elon Musk for years. Um, yep. What's your overview in terms of where he's at and everything he's buying and doing. Well, Elon and I were uh, founders along with two other folks, uh, Chris Payne and Ed Ho of X.com back in 98, 99, when there were two, still pterodactyls in the sky. Um, it was the early right. days of the, the internet. Um, and we founded X.com, which went on to merge with a company called Confinity, which became PayPal and you know the rest is kind of history. He and I had a fa fairly famous falling out, which has been the subject of uh, a couple of books and some articles, which has been pretty entertaining. But look, Elon's a force of nature. He's got a obviously very deep intellect. Uh, he he is his imposition of will is is second to none, 
and he likes to get things done yesterday. Um, owning the public town hall uh, and trying to adjudicate over information flow and what's offensive, what's not, I mean, good God, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a tough undertaking. Um, how a guy with his willpower, speed to decide, and you know, not known to suffer fools, how he interacts with regulators, if you look at the SEC, that's been wildly entertaining. Right. But, but now you've got an individual who, through SpaceX, is looking at off-world flight, through Starlink, mm -hmm. is looking at communications, through Tesla transportation. He's also got the, the boring company. And now you've got Twitter, the, you know, the tw town hall. Um, I just yeah. read Srinivasan's book, The Network State. And, you know, a lot of Elon's infrastructure is starting to look state-like. Um, mm -hmm. that's going to mean it's going to garner attention from entities like the U.S. State Department, especially if you comment on Crimea or Taiwan. But as his business interests expand and start to look more state-like, um, that's going to be right. very interesting to watch given his personality. And, um, you know, he's definitely a libertarian. Right. Um, and he's not afraid to break the eggs to make the omelet. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. We'll leave it there, Harris. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you.